Hello, I'm Karen Golden Orante here at the Cohasset Historical Society for Living Histories. Today I am with Henry Rattenberry. Good morning, Henry. How are you? Good morning. We are going to talk about Henry's experience, almost lifetime, in Cohasset. Now, you moved to Cohasset when you were a young boy, yep. right across the pond to 8 Black Rock. 8 Black Rock Road. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience in moving to Cohasset and moving to your new home? And Well, being just a young boy, I mean, it was uh, my parents at the time, um, the economy wasn't very good and they were renting a house on at 28 A School Street in Hull, which was near the Hull Fire Police Station. And they, we, were, we walked around Straight Pond one Sunday and we were walking by a house and it had a for sale sign on it in Black Rock Road. And my parents took down the number and they probably figured, well, you know, we'll call, but we never could afford to, to buy it. And the next week we went back for, to look at it with a broker. And the price was $6,000. And my parents said, we don't know. So I think what they did, I'm not sure, but I think they borrowed a couple thousand dollars from uh, my mother's parents and got a mortgage from the Milton Cooperative Bank and they bought the house. And it was, that was the end of the summer and it was about the, it was the 29th of October when we moved in, which was my birthday. And I was standing in the middle of the living, the kitchen floor waiting for, I was too little to help out much, but <clears throat> I stood around and I'm watching and the wind blew the front door shut hard, and there were French doors, and the kitchen ceiling fell on my head. Oh, gee. <laughs> I'm standing there covered with white plaster dust, and my mother's standing in the room looking at me, she's crying her eyes out. <laughs> so my father said, come on, we're out of here, we'll go, I'll, we'll go out to dinner. So they brushed me off the best they could, and we went to Cane's in, in Weymouth for, yeah. for dinner. So that was the initiation we got to the house. But we, my father at that time, he wasn't a carpenter at that time, but he worked at the Forum Shipyard and he was pretty clever with his hands. So the first the chance we had, I don't think they had, there was no such thing as home inspections or anything like that. Uh, you bought a house and what you got was what it was. And we got underneath the house and find, come to find out it was just a summer home. There was no foundation, it was on cedar posts. So we had to dig a, a trench all around the perimeter of the house and put footings in and we put a, a cement block foundation under the house that winter. And the, the, the house uh, sagged in places because the, cement, the uh, cedar posts had sunk and rotted in the ground. So we had to jack things up and level it off and uh, by the time we found two or three years, uh, it was pretty livable. Mm. So I stayed there until I was 21. Uh, I grew, got out of the service and I was an only child. So did you go to school here? Oh, like, well, yeah. no, I went to grade school here. Yeah. Fifth, so. sixth, seventh, and eighth grades. And then I went to Archbishop Williams High School in Braintree. So you went to, first school. you went to the Ripley, Ripley I mean, Road School. The Ripley Road School. And then to... Uh, the Osgood School, they called it on Elm Street. So what are your memories of the Ripley Road School? Um, I remember it because you know, the grades were small, the classes weren't very big, and the last, and the fifth and sixth grades were combined in the same room. And the teacher was a very young teacher, inexperienced. And children that age are rather unruly. Mm. And we used to have elastic band fights and eraser fights between the fifth grade and the sixth grade. And she tried to control a thing, you know, try to teach the fifth graders, get them started in reading or in a project and then go to the sixth grade and get them started. Well, by the time the, the year was over, she, they put her away, she went. She went nuts. She went nuts. Yeah. She had a, well, nervous breakdown is what she had. Yeah. And of course. So, what, so by the time you leave in sixth grade, you're like 14 years old or so? Yeah, about that time. So what, in the summertime during your, your Ripley Road School years, what would you do in town since it's such a... Well, uh, both my parents worked, so I was what you call, before there was such a, a, a name as a latchkey kid. Yeah. Because I was on my own from 7 o'clock in the morning until 5 o'clock in the afternoon until my parents got home. 
So did you take the bus back and forth to school? I took uh, the bus and the train. Yeah. And a lot of times I'd miss the bus or I'd, my parents gave me um, spending money for, for lunch and yeah. the bus money. Yeah. And a lot of times if I had the, the time, especially in the afternoon, I'd, I'd walk home yeah. and, and keep the money. <laughs> uh, you know, probably 50 cents or 75 cents or something like that. But that gave me money to, to go to the candy store and buy something downtown. Yeah. But uh, they, they did buy me a very nice bicycle and I put an awful lot of miles on that bicycle from Black Rock Road to come downtown, you know. Yeah. Because my area of town, there weren't any children. It was basically great big homes and uh, wealthy people. And for some reason, there were a few kids, uh, like I say, they went to private schools. Yeah. And I had nothing to in common with them. Yeah. So I would get on my, bi my bike after school and ride all the way downtown and play, play, we play baseball in the common, as I, as I told you at time, or be out behind the Osgood School, or Millican Field was just a, just a dirt field at the time. But uh, we played there occasionally too. The people that didn't want us playing on the, on the common, yeah, because it dug up the grass. So they would shoo us off and we would go, you know the town hall is now. Right. There was a, just a plain old field there Instead of a big parking lot? Yeah, it was sort of a parking lot. It was just a, a grassy, high grass field. And I don't know, somebody got somebody to cut the grass for us. And we put out whatever we could think of for bases. And we played ball there. We, we didn't care. We so it wasn't a, certainly an organized sport. Oh, no. So now, did, was it the same group of kids that would do yeah, these pickup games? Yeah, it would be the same group. Uh, sometimes uh, there would be too many kids. And you'd have to sit out and play a couple of innings, and they say, "Okay, you're you're up now." And you'd play a few innings, and then you'd be out, and somebody else would play. Did you have teams when you did this? Uh, they called it pickup. Okay. So somebody would be the captain of the team, and he knew who was good and yeah. playing. Yeah. And he says, "I want you, and I want Henry, and I want Frank." Right. And right. then, obviously, somebody would get left out. But they always got to play a little, you know. So now, since you were very close to Rocky Beach uh, growing up, yeah. so did you hang out at the beach? Did you? Uh, well, I did, but the, for some reason, the water was always cold there. Yeah, and it was open. It's gotten warmer since. <laughs> it has. Yeah, <laughs> but even as a child, uh, we used to call it the, your ankles would ache. You know, yeah, in the water. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but the kids, uh, all the kids that I knew from school, all went to Sandy Beach. Yeah. So I'd be on my bike again from Black Rock Road to Sandy Beach. And I'd be on the beach from eight o'clock in the morning until four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. And when I lived at, uh, up in Hull, it, uh, it was a beach called Gun Rock. Oh, right, there. yes. So I had a boat there and I couldn't take the boat to Cohasset for some reason. I don't know why my parents didn't want me to. So after a while, I got a, a skiff and I had it down at the harbor tied up at one of the docks. So then we could go to Bassins Beach, yeah. you know, while we swam over. And I spent most of my time at Sandy or, or Bassins Beach, or the bridge. Jumping yeah. the bridge? No bridge. Did you jump? Oh yeah. Oh, okay. We've got it on tape, you jumped the bridge. <laughs> so, but one of, the, one of the highlights of, for everybody to come over, you know, down Forest Avenue is to see um, the house on Black Rock Island. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us anything about your, your experience with Black Rock Island? I can. If you, I don't know if it shows there or not, but that's oh, just, you can. See, that's oh, the, the little that's stand a, in the back. That's a, that was the boathouse. Okay. And in that boathouse was an old-fashioned dory, double-ended dory. And in case they got stuck out there, that was supposed to be their chance of getting off the, the island with that boat. But it sat in there for, for years and years and years, and you could look right through the bottom. Oh. But uh, as I said, it sat there, it only maybe got used six weeks out of the year. Yeah. And uh, the kids who would, see, see the blinds that are on there? Yes, yeah. Those straps were black, uh, at that time were black iron straps and there were padlocks on them. 
so the kids couldn't break into the because they used to smash the windows out of it and get in and just hang out, you know. So what, what I found out after we talked about your rowing out to the island um, is Black Rock Island is actually in Hull. Yeah. I always thought it was in Cohasset. I always did too, but they pay taxes to the town of Hull. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it was built in 1900 as a coon, coon shoe. Yeah. Uh, cabin. Coot, they call it. Coot, coot. Yeah. Yeah. And they used to put the, there's another island on the other side of this, yeah. out of Black Rock, and they used to put the decoys out there, and the ducks would fly in, and they'd shoot them there. Oh, that's, that's not fair, but okay. <laughs> um, interesting. So. And, and on the other side of the house is a great big water tank yeah. that they kept, collected the water off the roof for fresh water. It wasn't potable, you know, you couldn't drink it, but it, they, they cooked with it and washed clothes in it, and I would bring the water, fresh water on drinking water out. Now, now you used to row the family, the Mr. Was it Hopkins, Hopkins out? Yeah. yeah. But he was, I very seldom saw his wife. Yeah. Uh, well, hello. <laughs> She's kind of removed here. Can't do much, can't go out shopping much here. No, or no. Grocery shopping, or you have to really go there and be. He was a wool broker. Okay. And that was his job. And uh, I think that being that young, I never thought about it, but I think he brought something out to the island besides water. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Not his knitting with his Not wool. his knitting. Okay. Gotcha. And he came in a bottle. Oh. Uh, so and even as a kid, you could recognize that. Well, I never thought anything of it. I didn't, I didn't know anything about alcohol. So. Yeah. So then you went off to the Osgood School on Elm Street, mm -hmm. where the police station is. Right. And then what year, what grade is that? That was when, seventh and eighth. Okay. But it, that was high school too, but uh, at that particular time they were building a new school up in Pond Street. They already started up there. They had started it. Okay. So by the time I got ready to go to the first year of high school, that was ready. Okay. So they took everybody out of that Osgood on Elm Street. And, and that was like 51, one. they, yeah, yeah. 1951, 1951 for the new school. Yeah. But at that point in time, the school on Elm Street was probably close to being condemned. Oh, yeah. That was very, very old. And very dangerous. And dangerous. Yeah. The gym was on the third floor, and if you played basketball up there, you could watch the, the floor move. Oh. So they had to condemn it the last year that I was there. So what memories do you have of the old school building? I remember the teachers. Uh, it seemed like, of course, to a youngster, everybody was old. Yeah. You know? <laughs> And I had a, a, a math teacher, her name was Miss Terry. And I had a very bad habit of running in the school. And every time she saw me run, she would say, Henry, stop the running. And I did it unconsciously. You know, I'd run from one class to another. So she said to me one day, you run, and next time I catch you, I'm gonna run with you. I'm gonna follow you. And I was, she did, and I was so embarrassed my face would be red. The kids were all laughing at me. You know? yeah. Poor Miss Terry with the snow white hair was chasing yeah. me down the hall. But there, there was, um, they were dedicated teachers. You know, Mr. Ripley was uh, the principal and uh, he, uh, he lived on, on Beecher Street. But he was very, very diligent in making sure the ch children were learning. But it wasn't a very big school and not too many of the children went to college at that time. Yeah. You, know? you either went to trade school or the girls uh, learned to cook or did or something, or mm -hmm. got married. But that's what I remembered. I remembered if you, if you were a naughty boy, you were sent to the boiler room to shovel ashes and coal for the furnace. Oh. And you didn't go home and tell mommy and daddy that you did that because uh, you would be punished again. Because they say, well, if that's if you were punished for doing that, you must have done something wrong, and you'd get punished again yeah. at home. So you kind of kept that under your hat. Wow. I never was sent there. But. Yeah, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> um, so now you didn't end up going to the new school, did no. you? Yeah. No, I what never was did. your What was your choice? Uh, my choice was to go to the new school, yeah. but my parents said that. Uh, my grades weren't particularly good, and they thought maybe that I was having too much fun in school. Because hmm. I went to parochial school first through fourth grades in Weymouth, and by the time I got to the fifth grade here, I was a year or two years ahead hmm. scholastically, so I didn't have to do anything. I could just, I didn't have to do homework or I didn't have to study. 
Uh, he had already had all what they were learning in the fifth and sixth grades. But by the time the seventh grade came, uh, I had, uh, they had caught up to me and I would, had gotten very lazy and I didn't, you know, I was, like I say, I had no supervision, so I didn't do homework and my grades had slowly gone downhill, C's and C minuses. So they were determined that uh, they were going to turn this around. Mm. So I was sent to parochial school in Braintree, Archbishop Williams. However, years later when I was in my 40s and had my own children, I found out my problem wasn't that I didn't study, that I'm dyslexic. Oh, and but, they didn't recognize it. Well, that. nobody knew what dyslexia was at that point. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I could study Friday night for test Monday morning and study Saturday, and I'd go to school Monday morning to take the test, and I wouldn't have a clue I, what I read. Hmm. But I learned in the service that through, they taught you, I went to school there, and they taught you audio visually. And I was at the top of the classes in those, in that, in that situation. Because you, you can grab, grapple yeah. everything visually right. and audio. Mm. So when you, so did you graduate Archie's? Yes, I did. Second graduating class out in 1954. Wow. I never flunked a subject there. Yeah. But the grades weren't good. So then what did you do after 1954? I, my parents said, you are going to college. Everybody who lives in Cohasset goes to college. I said, huh. I have a clue what I want to do. Yeah. So somebody handed me an application for Bentley School of Accounting. It was on Boylston Street in Boston. Uh, I think it's, it's a college now, I think, Bentley College. And uh, they accepted me. So I'm sitting in the classroom in October, a nice sunny day, and I'm sitting there with a spreadsheet in front of me and a desk, the old fashioned way, you know. And I'm thinking, I don't even like figures. So I slammed the book shut, and I got up from the seat, and I'm, the professor said, where are you going, Henry? I said, I'm going out, and I'm not coming back. And that was the end of that. Mm -hmm. I walked down to Post Office Square in Boston, and I walked in the Navy recruiter's office, and I said, I want to sign up. I was only 17. I was going to be, that was October, first week in October, and my birthday was the 29th. I would have been 18 on the 29th. And uh, they tested me, did fine, okay. Physical, took that right there, fine. Here's the papers, go home and tell you, your parents have to sign you in because you're not 18. Well, I went home with those papers and my mother absolutely hit the ceiling. You know, I'm not going in the service. My father was kind of, he didn't, if that's what you want to do, do what you want to do. But my mother said, you're not going. I said, well, look. Either sign the papers now and I go in for three years, or you wait till the end, my birthday, and it's going to be four years. So she thought about that for a few hours and she said, all right. And they, my father and mother drove me into, into Boston the next morning, and I was on a train for Bainbridge, Maryland, boot camp. Mm -hmm. Best thing that ever happened to Henry, because I was a very introverted child. I only spoke when I was spoken to, mm -hmm. and that's what I was told. Keep your mouth shut. Yeah. Unless you were an adult, ask you a question, you answer it, and be polite. Yeah. But uh, in the service, it's a case, you have to learn to get along with everybody because it's everybody's in the same boat. So I did very well there, and I went on to school at Great Lakes, Illinois, machinist made school, and did well there, and uh, off to sea I went for two years. And you went uh, on, a, on a USS Lexington, mm -hmm. which happened to be built at Quincy Shipyard. Right. My father worked on it. Oh, interesting. And, that, and yeah. my sons who graduated from college, uh, he had a full NROTC scholarship from Rensselaer Polytech, and he sent us, spent a summer's cruise on it in Hawaii. So where did you board the Lexington? Uh, the, it was when I graduated from school at Great Lakes, it was just at the end of being rebuilt out in uh, Bremerton, Washington. I don't know if you've ever heard of Bremerton, Washington. It's just a, a little t tiny town with a great big shipyard. Mm -hmm. And that's all he did there, uh, refurbished ships, built ships and refurbished them. So they shipped, uh, when I go, th just to go back a minute, when I graduated from machinist made school, if you were in the top 5% of the class, you got to pick wherever you wanted to go. 
for a, uh, like, uh, do you want to be on the West Coast or do you want to be on the East Coast? Do you want a big ship or a small ship? I put in for a destroyer on the East Coast thinking I was going to be in Virginia. Hmm. I got an aircraft carrier on the, on the West Coast because that whole class that I was in, they needed a crew for that ship and everybody, everybody went there. And where did you go when you were on the ship? Well, when it left the shipyard, that wasn't its home port. Uh, San Diego, California was its home port. And from there, we went to Japan. Uh, we, I did two six-month cruises there. But on the way over there, we stopped at Hawaii and uh, Philippine Islands and Guam and Okinawa. I saw an awful lot of the world, Hong Kong, Tokyo. Uh, almost got to the uh, Olympics in Australia that year. But the ship had such a bad reputation that uh, the, the admiral aboard. Why, why was it a bad reputation? Well, it seems like every place we went, there was a fight. Oh. Uh, the, we had a contingent of Marines aboard, and the Marines didn't get along with the sailors, and uh, there were a couple of other reasons, but uh, you would be very careful when you went ashore and who you went ashore with, Yeah. you know. But I always took the tours and went to various places. I was very interested in seeing what the rest of the world was like. Right. And how did you feel now that you're so far away from Cohasset? Oh, I was so homesick. Yeah. Wicked. And write letters, and I had a girlfriend here. Uh, I didn't even know I had a girlfriend here. Yeah. Because I was so shy. Yeah. But she'd write to me, and I'd answer, ask me questions, and I'd write her back. And it, it was gave me something to do, you know? Right. So I, when I got in October of, the day before I was 21, I was discharged. That was the agreement. Got in the day before I was 18, and I got out the day before I was 21. Yeah. And I uh, got discharged from San Diego, California, and I was on the first plane from San Diego to Boston that, you, that I could get on. Yeah. And I didn't care whether they put a big fence around Cohasset and never let me out again. <laughs> <laughs> uh. But it was, uh, you know, the grass isn't always greener on the other fellows. Because yeah. Yeah. I hated Cohasset when I was a teenager. Yeah. There was nothing to do here. Yeah, that's you know? what, yeah. Generations have said that. Bored. Yeah. But it was pretty nice after I saw the rest of the world. Yeah. Or you, half you of it. had a different perspective. Yeah. I could have stayed in and gone to the East Coast, too, but I decided three years was enough. Yeah. So when you came back, then what did you pursue? What, what were you thinking Well, of? I was hell-bent on going to college, and I knew what I wanted. I wanted to be a civil engineer. Yeah. But of course, uh, my grades weren't that great, so I went to a, a prep school on Newbury Street in Boston for one semester, took math and English uh, to improve those grades. And I did pretty well. So then I, I was accepted to Northeastern University and just prior to that, I had gotten a job at the shipyard. And I had learned a skill in the Navy of uh, materials proc procurement, parts for machinery and stuff. And come to find out, it, there was a niche for me at the shipyard because they were building ships and ordering materials. So I fit right in, so I had a job there. And the shipyard was booming at the time, and I had, I was working, uh, Saturdays and nights and trying to go to school at the same time. I was determined to, to make a go of the school, but there was no way I, I, I could do it. So I quit one, one semester in Northeast and, and I stopped and went to work at the shipyard full time. That's where I met my wife. I saw her and I had been going with a girl in Braintree for a year. And that girl, my wife walked into the office to get a summer job. And I said to the fellow working next to me, I said, see that girl there? She gets a job here. I'll have a date with her. This was Monday morning. I said, I'll have a date with her by Friday. <laughs> he says, you, you will not. I said, well, I got $20 that says I will. Yeah. I said, put your money up and I'll put it in the desk drawer. I had a date with her that Friday night. Good. So they had 20 bucks to take her out on a date. Yeah. You know. Oh, I really worked awful hard. I bought a brand new car. I yeah. took it to Newport uh, Jazz Festival to impress her. I took her to John, see Johnny Mathis in Boston. Yeah. Uh, I met her in May, and I married her in November. Oh, wonderful. Great story. That's awesome. 
and I've been married for 56 years. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> congratulations. So then after the shipyard, so how, after the shipyard, then where did you, do, what, how did oh, that? Oh, I thought I was going to be there forever. Yeah. Uh, my boss told me that, uh, oh, we had con we got contracts coming in, LNG tankers, uh, your job is safe. So, well, of course, we got married and, li and we lived in the Nichols house on King Street for a year. Oh, that's where Jonathan Livingston yeah. Seagull Square is, right? right? Okay. And so was that a was that a multi-family home? Four family. Four families lived in that home. Yeah. What kind of home was it? Oh, it, it was antique. Yeah. It had the big old-fashioned fireplace with the pot in it, you know, that the they used. Yeah, cauldron -y. Yeah, and the, the beehive oven for baking bread. And anyway, they lived in the downstairs apartment during the summer and then they went south in the winter and we just had a one bedroom apartment upstairs hundred dollars a month oh, wow that was big money so i decided that uh we're gonna live in cohasset i wasn't leaving i lived here all my life and i'm not going anywhere else i wanted to build a house mm -hmm. so my father at that time had become a carpenter not a finished carpenter he didn't do fancy but construction work, you know. So I started looking at houses around town, 25,000, 28,000, might as well have been a half a million, you know. Right. I was making $100 a week. Mm -hmm. And so my father said, well, you know what they're doing now? They're, they're building prefab houses. And I said, how do they do that? He said, well, I got a name of a place down in Aver uh, Waterbury, Connecticut. It's called Avrahomes. We'll take a ride down there and just see how they do it. So we went through the factory and they, they, everything was made on an assembly line, like an automobile. And they had four or five different types of houses, a ranch house and a split level house and a colonial. And they changed the floor plan however you wanted the floor plan change. And they would uh, erect it, uh, just part of it, or they'd do the whole thing, do the wallpaper and painting if they wanted to. So my father said, well, you know, we can, if they just put up the frame of the house, the outside of it, we can finish it, the rest of it. So I said, sounds like a good idea. So for $7,500, I had a house, well, $3,500 for the lot and $7,500 for the, the house. Shell erected, they called it. The roof was on, the windows and doors were in, and the interior petitions were there. And all the finished material was supplied to you as you got to, you know, as you've got to put the plumbing in. Uh, well, I had to hire a plumber and an electrician and a heating uh, contractor. But then they gave us all the finished material. The hardwood floors all came in, on a truck and the windows and the, all the trim for the doors and everything. And for $13,700, I had a finished house. Awesome. It wasn't really finished. I mean, there was no tile on the bathroom walls and there was no floor in the kitchen, but we did it a little bit at a time, you know, yeah. from that point on. At thirteen, $82.10 a month, principal interest and taxes. Wow, that's great. And I was making $100 a week. So I always had to work. Yeah. And of course, uh, we'd, I didn't even get the house finished. Of course, I didn't even get it started when the first baby came along. Yeah. And. The next thing I know, we had two babies. <laughs> I was, I didn't know what was causing the problem. I thought it was a virus infection. <laughs> so anyway, we wound up with four boys. Yeah. But we, but we managed. Right? They, they wouldn't give me a mortgage for the house. Uh, Pilgrim Cooperative Bank, Mr. Mulvey, was president of the bank. And I had to take the plans of the house and all the paperwork, what I earned, and my wife's earnings, she made more than I did at the, at the shipyard. <clears throat> and I took it all in one night and sat down at the, the big table, and Mr. Mulvey sat there, and he was president of the bank, and he looked at everything, and he says, no mortgage. I said, what? I said, my wife works, she makes, she said, no mortgage. Her salary does not count. <gasps> wow. I said, what do you mean? He said, you can build that house and she gets pregnant and she's out of a job, now what are you gonna do? Wow. I said, well, thank you very much, Mr. Mulvey. I go elsewhere. And I went to a place in Milton that my mother had the mortgage house and 
Black Rock Road. They gave me a mortgage. My mother had a co-sign. Co co right. That's how I got a mortgage for the house. Wow. And then my parents decided that uh, they didn't need nine rooms and five bedrooms on Black Rock Road, and the real estate market had picked up considerably. So they paid six thousand dollars for the house. Of I guess it was about ten years altogether. And I sold it for twenty thousand. They thought they made a fortune. Yeah. So they built the same kind of. They bought the lot next to me on uh, up on the hillside. Yeah. And built the same kind of a house, only a ranch, because they were getting older and they wanted everything on one floor. And they lived there until my pa father passed away, and then my mother died shortly thereafter. Yeah. Wow. So I wonder if that was one of the first prefab homes in town. No, it wasn't. Uh, there was one. Oh, I know. There was one. There was one on Stockbridge Street. It was a Sears and Roebuck's house. Sears and Roebuck's old houses, and there was one on Norfolk Road. Uh, but they were real prefab houses. They came in sections. They came down on a freight train, a flatbed car, and at the uh, depot court, and unloaded on a, on a cart. I don't know how the heck they ever did it. Yeah. But uh, they moved them from there to Stockbridge Street and uh, over to Norfolk Road. Interesting. And then, Who knew Sears Roebuck sold homes? They did. Wow. They sold just about everything. Evidently. Mm-hmm. Um, so now you are situated in Cohasset, mm -hmm. and um, so the, now the shipyard is in a rearview mirror. Then now, well, th thinking? then all of a sudden, 1960, 1961, the shipyard folds up. Oh. No work. My boss calls me on a Friday afternoon. He says, Henry. I hate to tell you this, but we got a reduction in force coming and I have to lay you off. I said, oh, wonderful. I got a brand new house, two babies, and the economy at the time was not good. Mm -hmm. You know, and there was no jobs around here. So I, he said, well, you can collect unemployment. I says, whoopee, that's <laughs> not going to cover the mortgage. So my father said to me, look, your name and my name are the same, Henry A. Rattenberry. He said, I'm going to give you my carpenter's uh, union card, and at that time Boston was booming, building, you know, everything. He says, go and tell them that you're a carpenter. He gave me a little toolbox with a couple of saws in it and a square. I knew a little bit about it because, you know, I had built a house. I went into Boston and uh, the Gillette building uh, was hiring, and I walked into the office and I said, I'm looking for a job. He said, what, do you, what kind of work do you do? I said, I'm a carpenter. Sign right here. And I was making seven, eight dollars an hour when everybody else around here was making four fifty five. Mm -hmm. uh, but you didn't work when it rained, you didn't work when it snowed. Yeah. You know? And I was only a little guy, I weighed 140 pounds. And I'm doing construction work, yeah, you know, putting up forms and beams and so I I I bluffed my I, I, the, you worked at partners in, in those jobs and I said to the guy that I was my partner, I knew he was pretty good carpenter. I said, look, I'm not going to kid you. I says, I don't know anything. <laughs> he says, well, I said, I told the situation. He says, well, I'll tell you what to do and you just do what I tell you. So I managed to six, about six months there and then I worked on the Prudential Tower and I worked at Harvard University. But as I went along, it got more and more difficult and more technical, you know. And somebody would say, here, here are the plans Go down the end of that building and start building some farms. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I, I got laid off uh, because of the weather and I came back to town. Lewis Bailey was head of the highway department here. And I knew him, but he knew me as a little kid. And I went to the highway barn, which was next, was next to the Red Lion Inn. And I said, Lou, I said, I got to have a job. He said, well, can you collect unemployment? I said, yeah. He said, well, look, on Thursday, go collect your unemployment check. He says, I got a little fund here, a little kitty, uh, for casual labor. He says, and I'll pay you out of that for as long as the money lasts. I said, I thanked him pro profusely because I needed the money. So I worked about six months, and I was working on the common, putting the, you know, there's granite curbstone around the whole common. Right. Right. I worked putting that in. 
And I went into the town hall to get a drink of water one day and there was on the bulletin board inside the door was a notice, a test for post office. We're hiring. I said, well, gee, that'd be a pretty good job, you know, part time uh, until I find something else. Well, I went, 13 of us took the job, took the test on a Saturday morning. Uh, three of us passed it. It wasn't an easy test at the time. Yeah. And there was one job. And I got it. So that was, my temporary job lasted 37 years. Oh, <laughs> awesome. So I have to tell you, when we're, we were talking about the Postal Service in Cohasset, there was actually there was a lot of very, very interesting history of the Postal Service here in mm -hmm. Cohasset. So the, the first postal house, but it really is a shed, shed. it was in 1803 by the Unitarian Church. Um, and then we went to a variety of other places, including a cobble shop at 100 Elm Street at the Joel Wil Wilcott's house. But the one that was really very interesting was the big develop, well, the big stable at 18, uh, in 1885, right at the south end of the common, just, just below St. Stephen's below Church. Saint, yeah, that was really, um, we'll have to show this. But the one that you started in um, for a moment, or was a bit w w when you were growing up, was the one at the Tilden. Yeah, um, right where Dooley's is. Right, so that was for quite a while afterwards, but um, in 19, well that was from 1911 to 1967. Mm -hmm. So in 1967, the new building was built at House Swamp, which is now the post office. So that's where you really spent most of your career at that can, point. Can I correct you on something? Surely, absolutely. I moved the furniture into that new post office in 1961. Oh, okay. 61, okay. Um, and before we were there, you have a picture there of the um, downtown. Oh, right, the downtown area. You remember yeah. it says where the sign said Coasa Colonial Pharmacy? Right, yeah. That was the post office too. Oh, inside the, oh, okay. Uh, well, the, the pharmacy wasn't there then. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what was there, but uh, we moved into that. Well, there's the that, pharmacy. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, then Coasa Colonial Pharmacy was down here. Okay. And let's see, what's there now? Caldwell Bankers. Right, uh, right. Real estate. And we were there a very short time while that post office was being being built on Depot Court. Okay. It was really cramped quarters, and uh, we when it was finished, we moved out of there, to, and I was there for the rest of the time. So obviously, mail has come has really changed oh, in the course of all yeah. of our lives times. Yeah. And one of the biggest things you were telling me about is uh, <clears throat> the automation. Mm -hmm. Well, not not just automation, but there used to be a lot more personal mail going ab about. Uh, yeah, well, in those days, people wrote letters. Yeah. You know, there was no computers and, you know, so you didn't do that. Uh, and a lot of, the per and, and Christmas cards, and oh. Easter cards, and birthday cards, and Valentine's. That was a big thing. Right. And um, w what was really very, and don't forget, Oh, magazines, Life Magazine. Lifetime, like, and, and Reader's Digest. They were huge, those oh, yeah. magazines. And uh, around here, Wall Street Journal, and the papers came through the mail too. Yeah. We delivered the pa oh. papers every Interesting. day. Interesting. And a lot of that was pre-automation, oh, which, yeah. which... We had to sort all that in sequence to, for, for delivery yeah. before we went I on mean, the road. It probably wasn't as messy as this, but... There was that. That's that's that. That's pretty much what it was pre-automation. Yeah, yeah. And that we, we there were as you I don't know if you remember or not, but they there were mail routes. There were six, five, five routes when oh, I was there. That's right. How many people? So when you started, how many mail? There were five, six carrier routes. Okay. Okay. And then there were the clerks inside that worked the window and sorted out outgoing mail. Uh, when but out, out of those six, how many cars, trucks were there? Uh, there were only there were only two vehicles at the time. And that meant four people walked. Yeah, the rest of it was walking. And did the same person walk the same? Same route every day. Okay. 
And it, it, when I when I was there for a short time, and I got the job, what they call the roundsman. Everybody had a day off, a different day off, five days a week. So there had to be somebody to fill in. So I had to know all the routes. I had to know all six routes, seven routes. And what were those routes? How did they separate those? Well, somebody, there was a postmaster and assistant postmaster, and they laid out the routes. And they went out on the route and, and timed you. So that there was, you had so many hours in the office, like two and a half hours to get the route set up. And then you had a half an hour for a lunch break. So that would be three hours. Then you had five, you had five hours to complete a route on the, on the road. And you had to be back by 3.30 in the afternoon. Wow. And what about, okay, now what about the guys? The, the, well, I have to say guys because there were no male no women male, there. No, no girls. So what if it was pouring out or It didn't wrist? matter if it was snowing. I mean, you could be trudging in knee-deep snow. Yep. I don't ever remember saying, okay, it's too bad to go out. And you can't walk around with an umbrella. No, you get soaked. <laughs> yeah, wow. So you had uniforms, obviously. Yeah, uniforms, and they gave us uh, uh, raincoats and boots and stuff like that. But if you thought, think about it, stand out in the rain for five hours, no matter what you had on at yeah. that time, uh, you got wet. So we never, never thought anything of it. You were wet, you were wet. Yeah. The only time it was bad was when it was cold. Yes, you know? and windy. Windy. So what was very interesting as well, so obviously if, if a carrier had a very long route, he couldn't put all of the mail on his back or in his no. satchel or bag. So how did, you, how did they take care of just not having such an oversized bag of mail? Well, you were limited. You couldn't carry more than 40 pounds. Okay? Yeah. So there were what they call relay boxes around town. They were painted green. Okay. And there was a person that went out in the morning, and you made up your relays for certain sections. How much mail can you, can I carry uh, in the bag? And when I got to the point where I couldn't carry anymore, I went back to the box and got another relay and started another section. So that's how those relay boxes worked. And you only carried, uh, you had to carry packages too, but only if you know, they fit in the bag or you could tie them on the bag you know, yeah. to carry. Well, in the course of just looking through mail, it was interesting. So in, in uh, well, there's actually a variety of very interesting things. So in 1803, when the mail first started, it was on one single sheet of paper you wrote, and you wrote the address, and it was like six cents from Cohasset to Boston or uh, 15 cents to New York. But I, as the sender, did not pay that. You, as the recipient, paid to get your letter, which I thought was really quite interesting. So you, you, ta you taught me something I didn't know. And uh, cause I, I think at that point, people probably said, I don't want the letter, I'm not paying, <laughs> I'm for, not paying it. for it. I mean, can you imagine today with all the junk mail? People say, no, I don't want that, I forget it. Let them How about bills? It. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, getting a, something in the mail today is like a gift, yeah. I think. So what was also very interesting, in, in 1913, in January, they allowed small, under 11 pound parcels. So people in rural areas would mail children, babies who are less than 11 pounds. So that I thought was pretty unusual because to mail a baby or a, an under 11 pound child, whether that child would go you know, on a on a on a uh, truck or on yeah. a train, but after six months of that, the post office got one and said, "Forget it. People are taking <laughs> advantage." For fifteen cents, they could mail Junior with a fifty-dollar um, insurance policy, which I think okay. Um, so now you are you are you are the floater mm -hmm. of sorts, and. Um, at that point, when you started, zip codes, were they around at, at that point? Not at that time. Yeah. And it was it, the 60s, it, that I think, uh, they started the zip code. And as I, I think I told you earlier, we thought, oh, zip codes, what a bunch of nonsense. That, that's not going to, that's another gimmick that they've, somebody's thought up, a brainstorm. That'll be gone in six months. Yeah. But uh, it has uh, evolved to a very, to the point where those zip codes, uh, m machines read them. 
and they, you, know, you, you get mail and you see the, these little barcodes on them? Yes. They, that barcode can tell you what city it's going to, what town it's going to, what street it's going, and what house. Is, and machine well, can read that. Now they've got those four extra digits. Mm. So each house, each building has that four extra digits. Uh, but, but, most you've of got them. Your five now, and then yeah. now you've got the four. And gosh. well, that, that, that's supposedly so that, uh, like when, when the mail comes to the post office now, it comes in trays, and it comes to it, t it says Route One, Route Two, Route Three. Because so it's on. been pre-sorted. All pre-sorted. To and it, it comes in the proper sequence of delivery. So the mailman, he doesn't, he's not standing there sorting in a case anymore. Right. He just takes that tray out, puts it in the truck, and follows the mail. Interesting. I know I had asked you this once before because, so everything that goes in the mailbox um, goes to Brockton. Right, from here. From here. Yeah. Because I had questioned, okay, so I have Sally's birthday card that I want to make sure she gets it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I put it in the mail today thinking that it's going to go in the building and get sorted and get to Sally's house tomorrow. Yeah. But it doesn't. It goes to Brockton. It goes to Brockton. The machine sorts it into the proper route and it goes back the it next morning. It might not get to her tomorrow. Oh, yes, it will. Oh, it will. It will. Wow. So they're working constantly sorting yeah. mail. Interesting. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that, that plant works. Wow. Huh. Uh, well, and now they all have fancy stamps. You can buy thematic stamps. You can make your own stamps. You can put your face on your own stamp if you want. Yeah. Interesting. So, um, but absolutely one of my favorite, and actually a lot of people, because this photo has surfaced <laughs> around the web with Cohasset people, is Henry going to and from work, I think, with... Uh, um, with Ralph. Ralph, yeah. That is amazing. So, how long was how long did Ralph ride in the back? How did you teach him to ride in the back of your motorcycle? You know, it was strictly by accident. Yeah. I don't know where. I know what had happened. I I was riding someplace in town. He was one of, at that time. Dogs ran loose. Yeah. You know, uh, you let the dog out of the house in the morning, and he came back for dinner time. But in the meantime, you had no clue as to where he was. Right. So I had the motorcycle and I was in town here someplace and who do I run across but Ralph? <laughs> so he, he wants to go with me, you know. So yeah. I said, okay. I picked him up, sat him on the seat, got on, and he, he was nervous. Yeah. I, what he would do was he'd put his head on my shoulder and the faster I went, the more pressure I got. Oh. And I, I could tell when he was not comfortable. Right. And the natural uh, thing on a motorcycle, when you go around a corner, you know, you lean. Yeah. And the natural thing is to, to lean the other way, especially right. for an animal. He never did that. He, he'd go right in the corner with he you. Was a natural, he was a natural passenger. And people see him on the back of the, riding in the car, and they, they'd see him, and they, and they, they yeah. look at him. Right. You know? Well, it was, a, it was a common sight, and it was really a, it's a fun memory for many people who got to witness And he was Ralph. a dog, and he was a mutt. Oh. Came from the Angel Memorial Hospital in Boston. Wow, that's awesome. So... You retired from the Postal Service mm -hmm. at what year? Year 2000. It's hard to believe I'll be ma retired 17 years on the 1st Isn't of July. Isn't that weird? Wow, where'd those 17 years go? I'm still having fun. Good. Awesome. You know, I'm still working. Uh, not laborious work, but it's something to get up for in the morning and a place to go. Yeah. And it feels like, you feel like you're, you're doing something, you're accomplishing something, even though only there's a, a menial task. Yeah. Know? So where are you now? At the Paul Pratt Library. Awesome. I go to work at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I'm out of there at 9.30. And 1st of September, I'll be there eight years. I'm working on another pension. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, Henry, it has been an absolute treat talking to you, and very, it's been a great to review to actually research <laughs> even the history of postal service here in Cohasset and learning so much about you know Cohasset's postal history as well as your history thank you very much oh, you're welcome thank you for watching living history bye-bye <laughs>